Well, welcome. Welcome to Friday Night Zoom, everyone. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. I trust everyone's had a fairly nice week. Enjoyed the rain. If you're here on St. Croix. And, and um, if we can just sort of leave behind us everything that, uh, you know, the day, the regular normal day, um, and come into this uh, time, this space, this Friday night Zoom with a clear mind, just dropping all of the baggage. from our life situations, which for most people tend to be problematic. So we can just sort of, you know, for the next hour or so, set that off, set those problems off to the side and forget about them. They, you know, they won't uh, suffer from uh, your inattention for an hour or so. And they'll still be there for you to take care of at the end of the meeting. Although they might not be. Sometimes a shift in consciousness is all it takes to make the... Uh, problems in life go away to allow the problematic life situations to resolve themselves because often it's more about what we bring to the problem than the problem itself. In fact, that's um, I think that might be what I want to, uh, or what uh, I will talk about this evening. Um, one way of alleviating stress and tension and anxiety has to do really with um, what we bring to the situation that we perceive as stressful or anxiety provoking. Um, and well, to, to, to sum it up, let me give you the uh, short version before I elaborate. Sometimes the, uh, the best way of dealing with stress and tension and anxiety or uh, irritation, frustration, whatever it might be, is just to not take anything personally. To not see everything that happens to us as happening to us, as having anything to do with us. But that's a, a habit, a mind pattern that becomes habitual um, because we have a tendency to sort of see everything through the filter of me, I. We often behave as though the universe revolves around us. Everything that happens is somehow happening to me. And in practical reality, that's rarely the case. And in absolute reality, that's actually never the case. 
But, you know, let's talk about this me and how, how this whole perceptual filter seems to arise. It, you know, it starts out when, when little Johnny is taught by his parents. He learns his name. Um, and, you know, there's a stage in childhood development where children will refer to themselves in the third person. So little Johnny might say, Johnny is hungry. Now, at first, you know, you see, Johnny is just a body-mind mechanism. And he feels hunger, the sensation, the physical sensation of hunger. And, you know, that's just the body sending a signal to the brain, hey, we need some food down here, do something. And, you know, um, before language is developed, before Johnny knows his name, doing something might be just screaming his little head off to get some attention and to get fed. But, um, Eventually, he starts to pick up cues from his environment. His parents are trying to teach him, and he begins to understand about words and language, and that if you're hungry, a good way of solving that problematic life situation is to communicate to your parents the fact that you are hungry. And so, like I said, sometimes the, the early stage of this for a lot of children is they refer to themselves in the third person. They say, Johnny is hungry. But then eventually they realize that I am Johnny. Johnny is me. So then they learn to say, I'm hungry. And now the thought concept of me has been created. That's not Johnny. Johnny is the one, the physical, the basic physical mind-body organism, which is experiencing the sensation of hunger and wants to do something about that. Johnny, I am Johnny. That Johnny is a thought in the head, which doesn't actually exist, but it's a, it's a, it's a useful tool. It's oh, the way that Johnny thinks about himself in concepts and language and words so that he can communicate his needs and wants to his parents or his caregivers. And so he tells them, I'm hungry. And then, you know, the, he either gets fed or maybe he, he, his parents are yelling at him for always being hungry or being such a nuisance or um, um, never thinking about anyone but himself. And so, of course, all of those thoughts, positive and negative, become a part of the story of me. And that story becomes attached to... Johnny, to me, to I, to the thought in the head. And as Johnny grows up, more and more thoughts and concepts and beliefs and opinions are added to that self-concept. Some of them positive, some of them negative. And Johnny forgets that that thought it's a tool that he uses to navigate around in the world, but it is not Johnny. It's very similar to, you know, the old saying about the map is not the terrain. The map is a symbol for the terrain and don't confuse the map for the actual land. And so we tend to confuse the, sim the symbolic I, which is a thought in the head, for the actual human being, even when that actual human being is us, let alone when it's someone else, which is even easier to objectify another person than to objectify ourselves. So, as you, by the time a person has grown up, they have got a steamer trunk full of thoughts and beliefs and opinions and concepts and things they learn from their parents and their school teachers in their head attached to the thought, me, my story, me and my story, me and my history. And so what tends to happen is everything that arises in the experience gets filtered through that self-concept, through that steamer trunk of 
baggage that we drag from the past. So we're never actually dealing with things as they are. We're never actually, when someone speaks to us, we don't hear what they're actually saying. We hear what our me thought interprets them as saying, filtered through all of our past experiences, including our own um, beliefs about ourselves and about the world and how other people are and how we are in relation to other people. So it all gets, it all gets run through a very biased filter. And I say very biased because it tends to be a negative filter. And we, we tend to develop negative self-concepts and negative thoughts about other people and about the world and about life in general because it's kind of a survival mechanism. It's safer to be negative and wrong than to be positive and wrong. Being negative and wrong, generally the result is you're pleasantly surprised. Being positive and wrong, um, it, you could wind up getting yourself dead. And so, you know, you'll hear people talk about, uh, oh, she's too optimistic, she's such a Pollyanna, just wait, you know, sooner or later, life's going to come along and clip her, clip her wings or clip her. I'm not sure if the saying is clip her wings or clip her like the football when you tackle somebody below the knees. But it, it, either way, it's a bad thing, right? So um, we tend to want to, we, we, we tend to be negative in our, in our, um, in the, the baggage that we carry around this thought of I. And so when something arises in our experience, if we interpret that thing that is arising through our, through a negative self-concept, we have a tendency to see it as almost like an affront, like an offense. We, 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 uh, we see it as like a personal insult. So, I mean, just to make this a little more concrete, like you, you plan a picnic for Saturday and it rains and you get irritated. All right. Why do you get irritated at the rain? Rain is rain. It's that's simply reality. It's simply what's happening. It's raining. Now, of course, I mean, it, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a preference. I want to go on a picnic. I would prefer that it doesn't rain. And I'm not saying you shouldn't um, take action here on, you know, um, maybe just pick another beach to go to or wait 10 minutes. But why does the emotion of irritation or frustration or anger arise? That, why does that, why do you get triggered by that issue? It's because you are, your, your self-concept, your story of me has a belief that, you know, the universe is out to get me. God doesn't want me to be happy. I'm paying the karma back for the time I was mean to my kindergarten teacher 30 years ago. I can never get what I want. Right? All these stories about how the rain is directly related to you. And, you know, the truth is, is the universe is, does not revolve around you and it's not raining because you wanted to go on a picnic. It's simply raining. For some people, rain is a good thing. For the farmers, it's a good thing. If someone's cistern is running dry, it could be a good thing. It's paradoxically, ironically, that at the same time that you're getting irritated because it's raining and you have to change your plans for your picnic, there's someone with a cistern running dry who gets irritated when it doesn't rain. 
And again, the rain has nothing to do with him or his cistern or his uh, water needs. It's not a personal act against him or a personal act against you. It's simply what is. But we interpret it through this mind-created sense of self with all of its negative self-concepts and other concepts, negative other concepts. And we tend to create a lot of anxiety and stress for ourselves, a lot of unnecessary anxiety and stress and irritation, frustration, anger, unhappiness generally by making everything about us. It's not just raining. It's raining on my picnic. It's not just a drought. It's a drought when I need water. So another concrete example, let's say you have, you plan for yourself a rather full day. You've got five or six things that you want to get accomplished today. And it doesn't seem to be uh, working out. There's traffic jams everywhere, long lines everywhere. You know, maybe some little shop you were gonna dash in and buy something you really need and dash right out again. You get there and there's a sign on the door, we're sorry, we're closed, sorry for the inconvenience. And so you don't, you know, <clears throat> you plan to get, to have like a really productive day and get six or seven things done and maybe you get one completed. And irritation and anxiety can arise if you if your mind made sense of self with all of its baggage and you, you're running through the perception of what's happening, the traffic jam is running through your head. This always happens when I try to get somewhere, when I try to do something. This always happens. Now, is that really true? Or you, do you just say it? Every time you get blocked from achieving something, every time you get blocked from achieving something, you say to yourself, this always happens. There's always a traffic jam when I'm trying to get stuff done. There's always a long line. They're, they're being deliberately slow. And you see, once again, it's all about, on the one hand, the simple, basic fact of what is happening there's a traffic jam, a store was closed. There's a lot of people at the bank, which becomes a negative story in your head, primarily because you're bringing all of your past negative experiences and projecting them onto what's happening now. So you don't actually see or experience what's happening right now you see and experience what's happening now filtered through your past story, your story of me, which, like I said, tends to be negative. So um, a, a, a really useful thing to do is to actually to be grateful for opportunities. Um, be grateful when you have something come up where you're getting nervous or tense or anxious or stressed out or frustrated or irritated or angry or even sad. Anything, anytime anything like that comes up, it's a wonderful opportunity because it gives you a chance to observe and learn. When things are going well, it's not a, it, that's good too, of course, but there's not a whole lot of learning space in that. But when things seem to be, seem to be, seem to be going not so well, that you can immediately begin to 
turn that around by first just acknowledging uh, with gratitude the fact that this is an opportunity. And it's an opportunity because the way that you learn from that is whenever you find yourself getting stressed out or tense or irritated or frustrated or sad or anxious, take a moment and step back and look at it. Look at, try to see if you can hear yourself turning it into a story about how existence is somehow personally offending you, personally attacking you, out to get you. I mean, that sounds kind of, you know, I don't mean, yeah, let's, it, um, that sounds kind of paranoid um, and a lot of people are, but it's not just that. It's not just feeling like it's out to get you. Um, it's also feeling like it, it's the arising of this in your experience is in some way directly related to you. It somehow is completely directly connected to you. It has, it's somehow is happening to you rather than rather than realizing that it's just happening and you happen to be there and this this steamer trunk full of negative baggage is can be so um convincing that not only can it take a neutral situation and make it negative it can take a positive situation and cause us to perceive it in a negative way and therefore to experience it in a negative way And then, of course, if a situation is what most people would consider negative, then that will become really negative when interpreted through this negative baggage, this past baggage that we all lug around us wherever we go. So, and it can be very freeing, freeing to just drop that baggage and stop lugging it around, to just let it go. And to simply experience what is happening now, now, as it is now. Because now there are no negative experiences. Now, everything is in perfect harmony. It's what is, it's happening because it's supposed to be happening. And the way that you know it's supposed to be happening is because it's happening. Um, one of the, the, you know, when the ego, the personal separate sense of self, the, this I story here dropped away right away, like all the other narratives, the story of how this has anything to do with me dropped away. They are you just see through um it's like an illusion that was never actually there it just goes away because it's not real there's nothing substantial to it so if you can just catch yourself whenever you're actually the body is an excellent feedback mechanism when feelings of irritation or frustration or anxiety or stress come up in your body. That's a physical sensation in your body. And it's telling you that something is wrong. Something is off. It's the same way that pain, you know, if you get a pain in your body that tells you that there's something going wrong that you need to, you know, address. 
It's like a warning sign, like a flashing yellow light. And the irritation or the anxiety is not telling you that the situation is wrong. It's telling you that your reaction to the situation is wrong or, you know, not as wise as it could be. So if you are feeling some sort of negative sensation arise in your body, instead of automatically assuming that this is happening because um, I can't get anything done today or my picnic is being ruined by the rain or whatever the external condition situation might be, you know, don't take the bait. Don't automatically go out there for the, for the understanding. Take a moment and go inside and look at what am I, how am I describing this situation to myself in my internal monologue? What am I telling myself about this situation? What story am I creating around this situation? And you've got basic facts. It's raining. It's a traffic jam, but you know, then we're all, we all turn into Charles Dickens and create this grand novel around these basic facts. And your grand novel is, uh, it's always, I mean, not only is it not accurate very often, it's always all about me. It's all about you. Everything is always all about you. And so that kind of sums up what I'm talking about tonight. That's kind of the basic point. It's not that it's uh, the universe is out to get you or you never get what you want or it always rains when you try to have a picnic. The, you know, the really under the fundamental underlying assumption is it's always all about you. The rain is about you and your plans and how your plans got messed up. The long line at the bank is about you and how you were not able to get everything done today that you planned on. So it's this, it's this, um, Huge, huge accumulation of past thoughts and beliefs and concepts and opinions within to slant towards the negative that we then filter everything happening now, everything that is arising in our experience now gets filtered through that and turned into a story that what's happening is all about me and it's generally not a good thing. It's not a positive development. So when you feel yourself getting stressed out, step back a moment and just observe the story that you're telling yourself about what's happening. And if you could just, if you can, if you can, if you can just watch that story, um, you often that alone is enough to just see through it, to, to see immediately that this is a fictional story that really isn't very accurately describing what's happening now and is tending to overemphasize the connection to me that what is happening now appears to have. And if you want to go further with it, you can also ask yourself questions. 
you know, is this really true? Um, is the event that's arising that I would prefer not arise arising in any way to have anything to do, to do with me is it is it is the sense that I have that it's directly impacting me true or is that giving um, my role in the universe a little uh, too grand a little too grandiose uh, a place in the scheme of things. If you realize, you know, if, if you see rain just as a fact of life, it's raining, then you'll simply um, adjust wait for the rain to stop, go to another beach where maybe it's not raining, make different plans. Okay, I'm not doing a picnic at the beach today. What else can I do to relax on a Saturday? And there's no tension associated with that. You're not generating uh, negative energy and getting your uh, energy field contracted from the, sen the felt sense of the need to defend yourself against this personal offense, insult, and onslaught that the universe is uh, prepared for you. Hmm? So you just simply um, respond intelligently to the, to the fact that it's raining. And so there's no stress generated from that. So the, 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 the stress and the anxiety and the frustration or the irritation, those things get generated in our body to show us that we're doing something wrong. And what we're doing wrong is relating to reality, something happening that is simply something happening Rain is simply rain. It's simply raining, no more, no, no less. But we are relating to that, reacting to that, as if it somehow directly concerns us, somehow directly um, says something about our relationship with existence. We're making existence wrong. It shouldn't be raining. Existence should be different than it is. Reality should be different than how it is. It needs to not rain in order for me to be happy. And that's because this self-concept that we created as children and learned uh, we're taught by our parents and school teachers and society in general and, you know, watching television growing up. That created self-concept, the, the me, the I in the head. Is a storytelling mechanism. It's a storytelling machine. It just generates stories. It just is constantly generating stories about to, to explain to itself what is going on. And those stories 
because of the perceived survival benefit of tending to be negative, which actually is not true either. Maybe that's a subject for another evening, but it's the received wisdom. It's uh, the, the vast majority of people believe that it's safer to be negative. And so your parents and your school teachers and your friends and uh, are going to teach you you learn growing up it's safer to be negative sometimes directly sometimes um, indirectly overtly covertly um, subtle sometimes in subtle ways sometimes by implication but the sort of underlying message in our society that it's safer to err on the side of negativity And that's sort of an automatic mechanism. So the trick is to catch it in the act. And once you've caught it a few times, um, you'll be well on your way to undoing it. And you know, the end result of that whole process can be just the sim simply um, undoing the whole story. It's, it's like the story is a negative defensive posture which causes us to contract our energy, which is what keeps the story going. It keeps this mind-made sense of self alive. And that mind-made sense of self feels like it would cease to exist if you were to expand your energy field and not be contracted and not be defended and not be separate from all that is. If you simply said yes to existence, and you know, the thing is, everything in the universe is interconnected with everything else. So whatever happens is what's supposed to happen because nothing else could happen. In order for anything to be different, everything would have to be different. In order for you to get your wish that it not rain when you're on your way to your Saturday afternoon beach picnic, literally the entire universe would have to change, would have to be different in some way. So when you are saying no to what's happening now, you're arguing with reality. You are rejecting existence. And that action of rejecting existence is what keeps the ego going. It's what keeps it functioning. It's what keeps it it's what keeps the illusion that you are a separate entity, separate from everything else, um, appearing to be true. So the long-term result of dealing with anxiety and stress and whatever arises by simply stepping back and looking at your response or reaction to what's going on and the story you're telling yourself in your head and asking yourself, is that true? Is this really an accurate, picture of my relationship to what is happening in the present moment. The immediate good benefit is simply um, short circuiting the arising of anxiety and stress because you're no longer fighting with reality. You're going with the flow. You're not running everything through that negative filter. And if you practice this enough, the long-term benefit is your contracted sense of self becomes um, less and less contracted, softer, more willing and able to expand
less of a, a forceful pushing against what is against reality. And that's really what meditation is. I mean, people turn it into all kinds of techniques, but or they they use it like as a an, an escape. But actually, meditation is really simply the natural state. It's who you are without your story. It, it's accepting what is as it is and allowing everything to be as it is. And so this is sort of like um, letting the me um, practice or rehearse how perception would be if there were no me. And, you know, I, I suppose there's some value in that. But so long as the me doesn't take so long as the me doesn't uh, take the the meditation, which is supposed to be imitating the natural state and turn it into a contrived thing where I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm going to force myself to imitate the natural state and then I'll really accomplish something. You simply do the natural state, which is to allow everything to be as it is. But it's not, it's not a doing. You can't do the natural state. You can, the, only, the only thing that you can do is the not natural state, right? The natural state is who and how you are naturally, without contrivance, without effort, without stress or strain, without efforting to do something or to make something happen. So let's that well, let's um, do a meditation. Um, we'll have our me's um, kind of get a little exposure to the natural state by not allowing our me's to really do anything. So the me always wants to know what am, what's, what am I supposed to do? So for the next 30 minutes or so, your me's job is to allow everything to be as it is. And that's it. And so as you're sitting here, allowing everything to be as it is, if you begin to wonder, well, should I be breathing harder? Should I watch my thoughts? 
Should I suppress them? Should I try to stop them if they come up? All of that is me. The me is wondering all of that. And the me's job is to allow everything to be as it is. So if a thought comes up, that's what is. Allow it. Don't try to suppress it. Don't try to stop it. That's what is. You allow it. But if you start thinking about the thought that just came up, if it starts a, a, a train of thoughts, that's, that is not allowing everything to be as it is. That is taking an action to change what is. So a thought arises, you allow it. And if you simply allow it and do nothing else, the thought will subside. And if it doesn't subside and you find yourself going down a train of thoughts, then that's what is. And you simply allow that. beating yourself up, saying, oh, I'll never be a good meditator because I always get distracted by my thinking. That's not allowing what is. And a really um, helpful way of looking at all of this is Everything is, everything is already perfect oneness. Everything is already whole and complete. Everything is already, if, 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 we, if the source, the infinite source of all life and energy in the universe is omnipresent, everywhere present, present everywhere, and I'm all powerful, omnipotent, and all loving, then there is nothing that is arising that is not already perfect, whole, and complete. Your difficulties in meditation are already perfect, whole, and complete. That is enlightenment. Your the arising of irritation, frustration stress and anxiety within you because of something as, as, because of, you know because it's raining and you were going to go on a picnic that is already perfect whole and complete that is enlightenment that is the beloved arising as that everything is always already the beloved arising as that the formless taking form the the So when you are meditating to um, experience your natural state and the me gets involved in it and uh, forgets to allow everything to be as it is, that is the beloved arising as you not allowing everything to be as it is. So it's already perfect, whole, and complete. So you can't do this wrong. It would be kind of silly if you're if you're doing a meditation to allow uh, if you're doing a meditation to uh, practice to learn to experience to give your me a taste of allowing everything to be as it is so it, to help break it of the habit of always saying no to what is of always arguing with reality of always pushing against existence if you're doing a meditation to um, ostensibly practice around that, allowing everything to be as it is. And then you feel like you screwed up the meditation 
and then you get upset with that, you're now not allowing everything to be as it is. Allow everything to be as it is, including those instances when you maybe during the meditation forgot or failed to allow everything to be as it is. Because your failure or your forgetting to allow everything to be as it is, is what is at that moment. So you allow that. So always, during the course of this meditation, we are going to simply, our, our, our your, me's, one job is to allow everything to be as it is, moment to moment. So whatever arises in that moment is allowed to be as it is. So we'll start now. Close our eyes and get comfortable. Just getting a, you know, my basic thing on meditation postures doesn't have to be lotus, doesn't have to be on a cushion, it could be on a chair, it could be laying down. Um, basically, you, you want to be comfortable enough that your body is not a distraction, but not so comfortable that you fall asleep. So whatever that is for you, that's where you want to move into right now. And then I always like to take just three deep breaths through the mouth, just to sort of like make a dividing line between, um, you know, everything after my third breath is, is meditation. So we'll take three deep breaths. Now we close our mouth and just breathe in and out through our nose. Eyes closed. And relax. And just allow everything to be as it is. Whatever is arising outside in your environment or inside in your awareness or your consciousness or your perception, thoughts, feelings, just allow everything to be as it is, regardless of whether it's inside or outside. Allow your breathing to be as it is. Allow your the rising and falling of your chest and stomach to be as they are. You don't try to change them. You don't try to keep them the same. Just whatever is, is.
and scan your body looking for any areas of tension. That's always um, a place where the energy is getting contracted, which is always a, a signal that your body is giving you that there's something that you're not allowing to be as it is. So it's often accompanied by thoughts like, you know, I'm not sure I can stay like this in this position for very long. I'm not sure I can do this. What is the point of this meditation? And all of those are not allowing everything to be as it is. All of that is arguing with reality fighting against existence, resisting existence. So if you feel stress or tension or contraction in your body, just place your awareness there and relax and allow everything to be as it is. Those little places of tension in the body can kind of like show you how you're even though you might think you're allowing everything to be as it is you're actually not allowing in so many subtle ways on so many levels so when you do a focus meditation like this of allowing everything to be as it is you can use those little points of tension in your body to help you to become, enter into a greater allowing. To, to catch yourself not allowing, to, to begin to see how much energy you put into not allowing. So just place your awareness wherever you feel any kind of tension or stress in your body and just allow everything to be as it is.
And so let's just sort of um, gently bring ourselves back, take your time. And you can open your eyes when you're ready, or you can leave them closed. So it's um, 10 after 9. We can uh, take a few questions if there are any. If not, um, I'll just say namaste and thank you everyone for coming. And um, uh, see you next Friday. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.